Uh, so everyone watching back home, most of my family is in Houston, so good uh, morning to everyone as well. So we're excited that you're here. So what I want y'all to do is, if you have a question about God or a question about Jesus or a question about anything that you've been thinking about, I want you to write it down because next week I'm going to take those questions and kind of try to help us understand them. There's a lot of questions that sometimes we don't get to ask uh, in a setting like this. You know, it's like, oh, well, this is not that time. And so sometimes sermon, uh, service, it's always a monologue. It's me telling you a bunch of stuff. But you're like, oh, but what about this? Or I had a co-worker say this. Or I had a friend say this. Or I had a whatever it is. So I want to take this. To, uh, so y'all can write any questions you have about God, about Jesus, and then uh, also people on Facebook. I'm going to include y'all. And next week, we're going to take all those questions and kind of break them down before we get into our next sermon series, which is... Uh, who is the Holy Spirit? We're going to be talking about who the Holy Spirit is from April to May because there's a lot of questions that we have about the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of things that people don't know. They think he's like some kind of force or some, I haven't even heard he's a woman and all these other crazy things that I've heard. And we have to break it down because um, it's important. The Holy Spirit is here for us he's, and God wants us to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, but most people don't know what that is. So we're going to be talking about that in, um, in two weeks from now into May, which is the day of Pentecost. And yeah, so Pentecost, and it's going to be leading up into the day of Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit actually poured out on men and women and, and transformed the church to what we see today. So uh, that's where we're headed. So, so last week we talked about the risen Christ. We talked about the fact that it's not over. That's not the end of the story, right? Uh, Gabby was saying, I was like, okay, Jesus died and that was it. She's like, no, that's not the end of the story. There's more to the story. And sometimes we get caught up in our situation and we look at our situation and we say, man, things are not going good right now. You know, we go through things in life and we look at our situation and we say, God, is this it? Is this the best thing that, we, that you have for me? Is this all that you have for me? Am I just supposed to be working at this job or am I just supposed to be working to live to get money and that's it? And God says, that's not the end of the story. And so I want to talk about some of the benefits of the risen Christ, but also I want to talk about some of the things that Jesus said while he was on the cross uh, that we didn't get a chance to talk about last week. So one is, Jesus was on the cross. And the Bible says that while he was hanging on the cross, the same people who were saying, praise God, hallelujah, hosanna, were also the same people saying, oh, you're God? If you're God, then take yourself down. And that's what they were saying here. They said, let him come down and I will believe in him. Let Jesus pull himself down from the cross because if he's God, he can do it, right? Because he can do anything. So they look at him and they say that. So my question is, what are we waiting for? What sign do we want God to do so that we can say, okay, God, now I'm going to be all in. What are we waiting for? Because I remember when I was uh, in high school and I said, God, if you do this for me, I'll become a Christian. And he did it. And I was like, oh, man, all right, I'm going to become a Christian. But then a few days later, I was back to doing my own thing. Uh, when I was in 12th grade, I, uh, I went into a fine arts contest. Uh, so fine arts, I, I, do, I do Christian rap now. Back then, I did secular rap. And so I joined. It's a Christian contest, but I, was, I, I wrote a Christian rap song, and I did it. And I did pretty well. I got 49 out of 50 points. And, I, and before I did, I was praying. I was like, okay, God, I can't memorize my song. I'm messing up. God, if you, if you help me win this contest, then I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give up drinking. I'm going to give up smoking. I'm going to give up girls. I'm going to give up rap. I'm going to give up everything. And so I got second place. The other guy, I think, I actually got 50, which he was a real Christian, so praise God for that. But I got, I got second place, which was, you know, pretty good. Uh, it was like about 50 other guys. And so, but in my mind, you know, I did real good. I still got a $500 scholarship and other things like that. I was going to go to nationals, but instead of going to nationals, I went and did my own thing, right? Because that's what we do. We say, God, if you only do this for me, I'll follow you. I'll give you everything. And that's what they were telling him. I'll believe in him if he does this for me. And some people are like, all right, God, I'll believe you if you let me win the lottery. If you let me win the lottery, I'm going to follow you. I'll give you, you know, 10% and I'll give you this. And that's, some, and that's kind of what they were saying in their hearts. And so my question is, what are we waiting for? What is that sign that we are waiting for when we say, God, if you do this for me, then I will love you. 
So I want us to actually kind of think about it. You don't have to say it out loud. I don't, you know, this is not confession time. But I want you to kind of think about it in your heart and say, you know what? What am I expecting God to do? And what am I saying, God, if you don't do this, I'm not going to give you everything. Because that's what we're saying. We're saying, God, if you don't do this for me, I'm not going to give you everything. So what are we waiting for God to do? What are we holding back from Him? What are you waiting for? What is the sign? If He gives you this, I will follow Him. The, the Jews told Jesus, if you're God, show me a sign. Show me a sign, because I don't believe it. This is another question that I really want us to ask ourselves. Like, really, really want us to ask ourselves. Everybody who's online watching, I really want us to ask ourselves, because we live in America, and there's thousands and thousands of churches. There's thousands and thousands of Christians. There's oh, millions of Christians. Do you really believe that Jesus died and rose again? Do you really believe He is God? And so here's the reason why I ask that. Because if we don't really, really believe it in our heart, if we don't really, really believe it in our mind, then, then we're just kind of playing church. And that's what happens a lot. So we have the Bible says to examine ourselves and make sure we're in the faith. Because I believe Jesus is God. I believe He died on the cross and rose again. But then we have to like really, do we really believe it? We say we believe it in our head. It's here. Because there's a lot of Christians that, that, that I know, or Catholics that I know as well. They say, okay, I believe Jesus is God. But you look at their life, they live a different way. If you look in the prison system, there's a lot of Christians in there. But if they're Christians, they wouldn't have murdered and raped and did all these other things. But they say they're Christians because they went to a church one time. And, and so I, I, I think this is important because many atheists say it's culture. If you grew up in uh, Bangladesh, you would be uh, a Buddhist or you would be a Hindu. If you grew up in the Middle East, then you would be a Muslim. So they believe because we grew up in, in America, we're Christians because that's what's around here. It's a cultural thing. We're a Christian nation. So we have to look at this and say, am I a Christian because my family were Christians? Am I a Christian because... That's what people in my school were? Am I a Christian because that's the only thing that was around? Or am I a Christian because I really believe this? I really believe this. And I think it's important because I was, I was uh, a few years ago, I think like two years ago, I was just thinking about it. I was like, do I really believe Jesus is God? Do I really believe that he died and rose? Like I was just, and, and I believe it in my head, but I was like, okay. Well, I believe it in my heart, but do I understand it conceptually? Do I, because I've been watching a lot of debates and atheists and, and Christians and all these things and, and I want to look at it from their perspective. Because if a Muslim comes to me and he tells you or he comes to you and he says, look, I was, a, I was a bad person. I used to rob. I used to steal. I used to smoke. I used to do that. Then I started following Allah and I started following Muhammad and now look, I'm a good person. I don't lie. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do all these things. And he told us that. Well, what would we say? Because that's what happened to me. I started following Jesus and he transformed my life. But if a Muslim comes to me and says the same thing, how, do we, can, how can we differentiate? How can we differentiate between the true God versus false gods, the true God versus false religions? How do we dif differentiate? And, and so those are some questions we're going to answer next week uh, that I'm kind of working on if y'all don't have those. But those are some questions because I think it's important because we don't understand that in other countries, they have they have all these different gods, and they have all these different things, and they're they're in their face. In America, it's Christianity or atheists. That's really kind of what it is. There's other religions, but that's kind of what it is. It comes down to: Do you believe in Jesus, or do you believe that evolution? But we don't think about evolution. We don't study evolution. We don't go to evolution churches and we don't talk about it. There's not evolution atheists that are walking around on the streets preaching or passing out flyers like we do and making atheist music and things like that. So we're not exposed to it. But if we were, how strong would our faith be to stand against it? When they come to us and they talk to us and they show us these things, can we stand against it? So these are some things I want us to kind of think about and, and look at. Because as America progresses, we're going to have those things. The Bible may be outlawed. Do we have the Bible in our heart or is it just on our phone? Is it in our heart or on our phone? Because what happens when they take away the Bible? What happens when they take away all these things? Then we don't know the word. 
in, in, in China, they, they outlawed the Bible. They only, some people only have one page of the Bible. That's it, one page of the whole Bible, and that's all they have. And they're still standing strong. And, and so I don't think we understand that. Like, for me to say, I have a lot of family members. I have some that are watching, and I have a lot of family members. And a lot of them don't know Jesus. They know it based, based on TV, and they know it based off, you know, what someone said. But they don't really know them. And so I'm, I'm broken hearted because when I'm in heaven and I'm, I'm in there and it's peaceful and it's good, but they're not going to be there. And that should break our hearts. But before it breaks our heart for them, we have to examine our, ourselves. We have to look at ourselves and say, do I really believe this? Do I really believe it? And, and we have to, we have to, we have to. Um, so one of my, my passions, so... I went to Bible college, I went to seminary, so I'm in debt, I have a lot of debt, school loan debt, it's expensive, and I spent years and years studying the Bible, but it's not just so I can know the Bible and say, hey, I'm smarter than these people, it's because I want people to know it too, I want them to experience it too, I want this, so you don't have to go in debt, I already went in debt, but you can share the benefits, you can share the benefits, I want to give this to you. I want to give this to you, all this information, and all the here, all the, I, uh, sometimes I'll still be with a friend, sometimes I still have nightmares, waking up, and I didn't study for a Greek test that I had, and it's a nightmare, I'm like, oh man, I didn't study for this test, I'm going to fail, I have to learn all these Greek words, and all this stuff, and then I, like, I wake up, early. Like, oh, I graduated, I'm good, it's okay, I can breathe again, there's an anxiety that comes, alright, there's an anxiety of, of Hebrew and Greek that sometimes I still struggle with. God's going to deliver me one day. But anyways, I want us to look at ourselves and examine ourselves. Take some time today. Take some time this week and say, okay, do I believe this? And if I do, it should have, it should do something to me. There should be a change. There should be a difference. There should, there has to be a difference. So let's talk about the words on the cross. So Jesus in Luke chapter 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And this is after the people have pierced his body. They have pierced his hands, and he's hanging on the cross. And they're spitting at him. They, they ripped out his beard. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And he's saying, God, forgive them. Forgive them. And it's one of the hardest things to do. Because it's hard, because God calls us to do the same. He wants us to forgive those people who have hurt us. He wants us to forgive those people who have mistreated us. Not on accident. Not on accident. But those who have done it on purpose. Because he does the same thing. He says, I'm doing this for you. I'm forgiving you. The Bible said, while we were sinners, while we knew what we were doing, he did it for us. There's a story of this man told. He was at a college university and he was talking to people. And this lady comes up and asks a question. She says, if... God is going to forgive me anyway. Then why can't I just continue sinning? Right? God's going to forgive me anyway so I can just sin. Because He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. Let me just continue sin because He's going to forgive me anyway. Why can't I just do what I want? And so the guy told this story. He says, imagine if you were in a boat and you're with your dad. And you go out into, you know, a lake. And as you were on that lake... Um, your dad, he, he kind of goes away, he's doing something, and you're in the lake, and, and you're, you're, you know, you're having fun in the lake, you have paddles and all that, and he says, don't go into the water because there's, there's alligators in there. There's alligators in this water, so don't go out, and don't go out of the boat. So the little boy, or you, you get kind of bored, you start splashing the water a little bit, and you start tipping it over, and you fall. You fall out of the boat. The boat flips over. You fall out. You're into the water and you see, oh man, there's all these alligators coming. There's all these alligators surrounding me and they're coming. And you're so afraid you fall asleep. You just, you, you just collapse. You wake up and you look and you're on the shore. You're on the shore. Your life is you're not, it's not in danger and you look but your father is there and he's all beaten. And he's eating. And he's blood, he's bloody. And would you see that and say, I'm going to go play in the water again. I'm going to go play in the water because you know what it costs your dad and you see who is hurt. Or would you say, I'm not going to play in that water because I see what it costs. Amen, that's good. I see what it costs my dad. The same thing is with Jesus. 
He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He says, I'm taking this punishment and I'm getting beaten. Are you going to go again and sin on purpose? Are you going to go again and practice sin? Are you going to go again and do it even though you see what it took and what it cost me and how I feel and what I experienced? And so, of course not. Of course not. Because we love our Father or we love that person who did that for us. We love Jesus. It changes our heart. When I became a Christian, it was because I didn't want to go to hell. I'm from Houston. We're in Texas. And it gets hot. <laughs> It gets real hot sometimes. And we're sweating and it gets humid. And oh, if, if hell is worse than that, I don't want to go there. I don't. So that's how I first became a Christian. But then I backslid for two years. I went back to drinking, smoking, and all that other stuff. That was shortly after the time that I won that Christian contest. Shortly after I won that, I went back and I did all those other things. And whenever I gave my, my life to God and I rededicated my life, I didn't want to sin because I knew I was hurting someone I loved. I said, I don't want to do that anymore. So the, the, the idea of me drinking, it just, I was like, why would I continue drinking? Because I'm, uh, I'm going to get drunk. And I told you all the story last week. I threw up for two hours straight. That's part of it as well. But I said, I don't want to do this anymore because I'm hurting someone I love. When I sin, I'm hurting him and I'm doing it on purpose. It's not, it didn't seem fun anymore. I thought it was fun doing all these things and then when I seen how I'm hurting him, I didn't want to do it anymore. It just wasn't fun anymore. And so that's what God calls us. He says, I see these people. They lied to me. They spit at me. They betrayed me. And I forgave them. And Jesus says, I want you to do the same. I want you to do the same. And that's incredibly hard. It's, so, it's, it's very hard for us to forgive people who hurt us. Especially when we know they did it on purpose. Especially when we know that they haven't repented yet. Especially when we know that they're still talking behind our backs. I have, we have family like that. We have friends like that. We have enemies like that. Sometimes it hurts more when it's a family or a friend than it is an enemy. Because we expect that from our enemy. We don't expect that from someone we love. But that's what Jesus says. I love you. And I want you to do the same. And about 3 o'clock, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema. Sabatani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? This is Jesus. This is the Son of God on the cross. And he's crying out to God. He says, God, why did you forsake me? God, where are you at? Why do I feel like I'm going through this alone? Why do I feel this, this emotion I have never felt before? And so part of it is because he's feeling what we're supposed to feel. Separation from God. When we die, and, and so so some people say hell is this torment and being you know tortured all the time, all the time, and that's part of it. But the other part of it is knowing that God is not there. His presence is gone because we have a lot of bad things that happen in this world and in in the U.S. A few weeks ago, you know, we had the bomber, and then we have shooters, and we have all these other things that are happening. But God is still here because there's people intervening, intervening, and doing something about it. But imagine if God wasn't here, the love of God wasn't here, and there was no one who would intervene. It would just be harsh chaos all the time. Because His presence is no longer here, and that's what hell is. So even worse than torment, it's going to be not having God's mercy. Not, not having God's grace. And so that's what Jesus felt. The, the departure, and, and God was no longer there. And so that's what he's feeling. And so what it's, it's, it's showing also is that he knows what we're going through. That's right. He feels what we're going through. Because sometimes we feel like that. Even if we are, we're married and even if we have a spouse or we have someone going through the same thing with us, we still sometimes feel like I'm going through this alone. Mm -hmm. I feel like no one's here with me. I feel like I'm, I'm by myself, God. And he says, I feel that. I understand what it's like. And he can walk with us through that. He can walk with us through that pain. John 19, 30. Jesus said, it is completed. It is finished. It is done. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible. He says, it's done. You don't have to work for it. You can't work for salvation. If, 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 if I do something that God loves, then he loves me. But sometimes we think if I do something that God hates, he doesn't love me. 
Sometimes we think if I do something against God, He's not going to love me anymore. But that's not the truth. He still loves us. He wants us not to do those things. But He doesn't love us less. Because sometimes we think, oh, well, you're the pastor. You pray, like, let's say if I pray two hours a day. Let's say if I read the Bible an hour a day. Let's say, I don't, just so y'all know. <laughs> but I, I don't. But let's say if I read the Bible two hours a day, right? And I pray three hours a day. And you're saying, well, God must love you more. I got to read more so God can love me more. And he's saying, no, it's finished. Thank you, Lord. I love you. I love you. Even when you mess up, even when you don't read the Bible at all, I still love you. Even when you forget to read, even when you forget to pray, even when you mess up, I still love you. It's finished. Hallelujah. I'm not going to love you less. I'm not going to love you less. And that's what God is saying to us. It's finished. We don't have to work it out. We have to work out our salvation. We have to continue growing. He wants us to continue to grow, continue to get stronger. He wants us to read. He wants us to pray. But that's not what's going to make him love us more. He loves us because we are his creation. He loves us because we are his children. And then lastly, in the Bible it says that when Jesus died and he says, I give up my, my spirit. And he, he said, it is finished. It's completed. It's done. The temple the, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. So we don't understand that because we're not in the Old Testament time. We're not in the Hebrew Bible. But let's say if from this wall here, so this all the way over there was considered the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the pastor or the priest can go into the Holy of Holies. And I can offer a sacrifice to God once a year, only once a year. All of you all... Y'all can never go into the Holy of Holies. It's too holy. If you go in there, they had bells on their, their garment. Because if, if I'm going in there and then you hear the bell stop, that means I'm dead. Because I wasn't holy enough. I went into God's presence and I wasn't holy enough. And the bell stopped. They're like, oh man, this guy, like he, he, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. So they dragged his body out. And that's what it was. You weren't allowed to go to God's presence. You weren't allowed to go to God's presence. Only the whole, the high priest. One time a year. That's it. That's it. And God is saying, it's torn. This presence that was not allowed for everyone to have, it's torn. It's gone. That means we can go boldly before God. We can go into His presence whenever we want. His door is always open for us. Imagine if you go into like a CEO's office. You go into someone that like Steve, well Steve Jobs is dead, but Bill Gates or somebody like that, right? The door is open. And you can come in. But let's say the door is closed. You have to make a meeting. I was trying to talk to a pastor a few years ago. And he said, yeah, you know, just, just uh, let's, let's schedule a meeting. I couldn't schedule a meeting with this guy for six months. I'm like, seriously? This is crazy. But imagine that. You can't talk to me. You come to the church. You come to church. And I can't talk to you. You got to schedule a meeting with me. You got to schedule a meeting with me. I'm sorry, man. We can't talk. We don't have that relationship. And so what God is saying, that's no longer going to be the case. My presence is going to be with my people. Not only that, the Holy Spirit is going to be inside of us. So that curtain was torn, it's ripped down. We can come into God's presence anytime. We can come to His presence not just when we're in church, but when we're at home, when we're at work, when we're in our vehicles and we're driving, when we're in front of somebody and, and we don't even like that. We can be in God's presence. And God can change us. God can change the situation. And so that's what God was saying. He's saying the curtain is torn. It's no longer there. Therefore, since we have a great priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold to our confession. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses. He's saying, we don't have this guy who's saying, hey man, you just get it right. I'm messing up, God. I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. Hey, you got to take care of it on your own. I, I did it. I'm Jesus. And hey, I did it, but you can't do it. I was human. Just figure it out. He's saying that's not what he's like. But instead, he sympathizes with us. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by one of your closest followers. And he understands. And so he can sympathize with us. When we're struggling, we can come to him and say, God, I feel like you're not listening. I feel like you're not hearing my prayers. I feel like I'm going through this all by myself. Where are you? Because that's what Jesus said. And it's okay. 
It's okay. Because He's with us. And He's saying, I'm there. I'm, I, it's okay because I'm your high priest. But we have one that has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet He did not sin. Therefore, let us come confidently. Let us come boldly and approach the throne of grace and receive mercy. And find grace whenever we need help. Amen. He's saying, that's what we have. The, tor the, the curtain is torn, so that's what you get. Whenever you need grace... Whenever you need mercy, whenever you need God, you can come before His throne. You don't have to book an appointment. You don't have to put it on your calendar. Okay, I, 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 got, it, I got it on my own right now for five months until this, this God, He opens up His calendar. He got a lot of kids, right? He got a lot of Christians. He got, there's a lot of people calling on Him. Well, the, the people in the Middle East are more important than me right now, so I got to just do it on my own. He's saying, no, I have a yoke. And it's light and it's easy. And so the thing about a yoke is we don't live in, in the, the old times because we just go to the store and buy our food. But a yoke was, it's this thing that goes around the neck of two animals. So they can pull and, and break up the ground. Like when we're, when we're planting, they don't have they didn't have all the machinery. So what he's saying is, I'm going to put it on your neck and I'm going to help you carry it. The things you're going through in life, I'm going to help you carry it. I'm going to help you. You're not by yourself. You don't have to go through it alone. I'm going to help you carry it. My yoke is easy because he's doing most of the work. He carries us. He lifts us. And we can come confidently, boldly before his throne and receive grace. We can receive mercy. And so I prayed this over some people. I wanted to say it last week and I forgot to. But the idea that. Everyone as we come and what we believe that we are lampposts. That's the name of the church. We're lampposts. So you see this light. If we turn off all the lights, that light and it's still on, it's a lamppost. It, it's symbolizing light. And so just as we have a thermostat on the wall, if I want to change the temperature, it's too cold in here, I turn it up. If I want to change it and bring it down, I turn it down. We do the same thing. God calls us to do the same thing. We are lampposts. We are thermostats. We control the influence. We control the atmosphere. We change that. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be those lampposts. He wants us to be the hope bearers. When we go into a setting, it changes because we're there. We have this inside of us. We have the hope that the, that the curtain is torn. We have hope that it is finished. We have hope that God has forgiven us even while we were still sinners. We have this hope but other people that don't, we have to give it to them. We have to be there with them. So let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you, God. I thank you, God, because you, you want us to know these truths. You want us to know that you are here with us. You are Emmanuel, God with us. Whenever it's too hard or it's too big, Father, you say, I am with you. I am with you. I can help you carry this. Come to me and I'll give you mercy. If you don't know what to do, come to me. Father, you're just a, you're, you're a good Father that's waiting for us. And sometimes we try to do it on our own without you. Father, we try to do it on our own without you. And, and, and Father, and we mess things up and you're saying, I, I want to help you. I want to give you wisdom. I want to give you strength. I want you to know that you are not alone. The, the, torn, the curtain is torn. Father, I thank you, Lord, for everyone hearing me today. I pray, God, you speak to them, God. I pray, Father, that we would examine ourselves. And I pray, Father, that we would let go whatever whatever is holding us back from you, God. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray.